Joining me today is an entrepreneur, a venture capitalist, an author, the co-founder of PayPal, the first outside investor in Facebook, the founder of Palantir, and Silicon Valley's ultimate contrarian thinker, Peter Thiel, finally welcome to the Rubin Report. David, thanks for having me on the show. The general tenor then right now, that we sort of are between a rock and a hard place, where it's like you've got Trump and he's not gonna change his tactics. And you know, I think I've been very fair to him and that's why I get a lot of criticism on that front. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the, the resistance or whatever you wanna call it that seems to be doubling down on a lot of the bad ideas that got them there in the first place and that both sides now are just splitting and splitting and we're, we're losing what I, where I think most people are, which is within some sort of basically free society, libertarian, live and let live thing. I think, I really believe that's where most people are, but we seem to be being pulled in, in opposite ways. Well, um, the way, the way I, would, I would frame it a little bit differently, I, I would say we're, um, we're, um, we're moving past the Bush-Clinton um, sort of duopoly, mm -hmm. and um, and it, which was not exactly libertarian. Um, it was pretty narrow, pretty narrow zone. There wasn't very much debate. Um, you know, all the smart people supposedly agreed on everything, and it didn't work all that well at the end of the day. You know, we had sort of uh, you know one one fake bubble in our economy after another, and um, and it and you know it sort of got us into a lot of things that that were were not optimal, and so uh, so I think you know for the Bush Clinton, maybe also Obama years, so those 24 years, the debate I would say was 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 uh, was too narrow, and I think within that that sort of super narrow center to center left debate in this country, uh, you uh, you're not going to find the solutions to our problems. It's going to be it's going to be way outside of that, and and I think you know I, th I think we will not go back. You know, we're not going to go back to Hillary Clinton in 2020. Mm -hmm. We're not going to go back to Jeb Bush. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a more wide open debate. And there are the parts of it that I don't like. Yeah. I, don't, I, I think, you know, I think, uh, I think the socialist question is going to be on the table in ways that it hasn't been for a long time. And, uh, and I think, you know, I suspect the Democratic Party is going to move much further to the left. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a debate we're going to be having for the next decade. You know, I think they're wrong. I think that's not going to work. But it's, it's again, it's the Clinton, the narrow Clinton stuff. Um, not going back to that. Okay. So one more thing on Trump for now. When, when you finally then came out, so to speak, and, and said, "All right, I'm going to support uh, Trump," just personally, do you do you feel like it cost you anything? Just you know, friends, family, like, or did you even care if that was going to be the case? Because a certain amount of people are going to go, no matter what you just said here about all the legitimate mm -hmm. issues related to trade and government and all that, mm -hmm. they're going to go, he's racist, so now Teal's racist, or, or something along those lines. You know, I, I don't think, it didn't cost me any friendships. Um, and, you know, and, and, but there probably were, you know, there were, there were, there were some set of people that, um, you know, where they were mad at me that had not been mad at me before, and, you know, that's unfortunate. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, um, you know, I, I didn't think it was that controversial. You know, I, uh, you know, sort of. I, uh, it's, it's sort of like, like in one in one way, it was one of the least contrarian things I've ever done. It was like half the country. It's not that contrarian. Right. I've heard you say that before. So, it's, it's kind so, of funny. In Silicon Valley, it felt really contrarian. Yeah. But um, but so that's that's sort of why you know if you're if you're doing something that half the country agrees with you on, um, that it's kind of weird for that to be beyond the pale. I mean, maybe it is. That's, that's actually that's, hilarious. That's, Supporting that's really Trump crazy. was your least com contrarian move of, of sure, the last sure. it was, 20 it was, years. It was, it, was, it was in a way the least contrarian thing I've done. And so, so uh, it, it, uh, it, it's kind of, um, you know, uh, but, but there is something about um, the politics that's intense. It, um, it's felt zero sum for a long time. Um, and, and, you know, it is polarized. It's extreme. We don't know what the answers are. And so there are there are ways that it's been, um, you know, it's been weaponized that are, that are not always, not always healthy. So yeah. I, I, uh, you know, I, I don't think we're gonna go back to the status quo ante, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, that's just it's sort of gone with the wind. It's mm -hmm. not, we're not going back, you know. It's, uh, and, um, and it's, it's quite possible we're gonna, you know, have sort of, you know, ever more intense politics for quite some time. You know, one of my colleagues coined this term about a decade ago that, um, you know, it was, uh, I think it was the, 
John uh, Jim Cramer, the crazy uh, person on CNBC, yeah, yeah. he has this line where there's always a bull market somewhere. You have to just look for it. You have to know where to find it. And you know, and then the bull market, uh, my colleague suggested, uh, this was around 2008 that was getting started, was a bull market in politics, and uh, which is not a, not necessarily a place where you want there to be a bull market, but uh, but I think I think we are in a sort of bull market in politics, and uh, and it, it still has no end in sight. And, uh, and we're, and we're going to be looking for um, options that are further outside the box, and uh, and the debate may be may be even more intense in the in the years ahead than it has, than it's been before. All right, I think that's enough about Trump for now. I have a feeling he'll probably appear again. But uh, let's talk about sense making because Eric Weinstein, mm -hmm. who uh, I guess is the architect of the intellectual dark web, who is the what is his title? He is the managing director of Teal yeah, Capital. Yeah, yes, yeah. Sort of man of many hats. A man of many hats. Okay, so one of the ideas that he has discussed many times in this very studio is that what's happening right now is that our sense making, our communal sense making in America is just failing. That our ability to trust the media or CNN or New York Times or the rest of it has failed to the point that this intellectual dark web, this crew of about 20 or so people, uh, are the last bastion of our ability to just make sense of things, or at least try to make mm -hmm. sense of things. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of questions on this, but first, Eric works for you. You guys have major disagreements. He was a Bernie guy. You obviously supported Trump. Uh, I'm sure he's been on these shows and talked about probably policies that you don't agree with and things like that. Yet you let this guy do whatever he wants. I, I think that's a great credit to you, but why, why do you do it? I mean, why do you let this guy run around and, and do whatever he wants to do, even when it's in conflict with what you believe? I don't well, think most people would do that. Well, I'm, I'm interested in ideas always. And uh, I think that uh, I don't think all the ideas are, are just the conventional ideas. I think there are, um, I, think that, I think we need to find new ideas, new ways of approaching the world, thinking about it. And, um, and Eric is certainly, you know, absolutely first rate heterodox thinker and uh, and you know I, I don't think you know I think all of our politics are somewhat eclectic and somewhat complex and you know and uh, you know Eric's more on the left I'm more on the right but uh, but uh, we, we're both interested in ideas we're interested in figuring out how to make sense of our world and uh, and that unites us and, and and it's always surprising how that's a pretty unusual place to be there yeah it's it's, it's much of it's not about ideas. It's, as we said earlier, it's about power or fashion or, or something like that. But, but most guys in your position wouldn't be allowing one of their, their top people to be out there often taking positions that are against them. That, there's something about you that's allowing you to do that, right? You know, I... I, I know I you don't, don't want I I don't, I don't, I don't, to sit here and pat yourself on the back, I but I, I think it's an I, important piece of something. I think, um, and I'm not sure I'm right about this, but let me, let me, let me be a little bit more modest on this, but um, I think most most uh, of my peers in Silicon Valley um, think that the ideas are are more set. We, we sort of know all the right answers, and it's inefficient. It's a waste of time to be exploring outside of that. And and so the the sort of the substantive question you have to ask is, are the ideas right, or you know should we have more exploration? So it's like you know if you take the take the climate change debate. Mm -hmm. There's there's a view that you know. We know it's happening. Oh, we here know it's we go, Teal. <laughs> we know that uh, you know, it's a runaway problem, and um, and uh, and if we, we we can't we can't even pause mm -hmm. and think about it because we know all these things. We have to just focus all our energy on on solving them. And so, if those things are true, then that might be reasonable. If they're if they're not entirely true, like maybe you know, maybe maybe climate change is. Maybe it's more methane than carbon dioxide, in which case maybe uh, eating steak is worse than driving a car. So maybe, maybe climate change is a problem. It's a little bit different from the way we think it is. And so if, if these things are not true, then we need to have much more of a debate. And so the, the kind of question that's very hard that you have to have, make some judgment on is, do we more or less have the truth about everything, or don't we? Yeah. And my view is that we're like really far off. And I think a lot of my peers think, you know, you were, we're kind of at the end of history. We've sort of figured everything out. There's, we don't want to be long ideas. We don't want to be, you know, interesting, weird ideas are just wrong and they're just a waste of time. And that's, that's sort of their, their bias. Mine's the opposite. Yeah, do you think that this 
set of people, and I think I would include you in that in, in a broader sense. I mean, now you're, you're sitting here and doing this. Um, do you think we have a chance of resetting some of this stuff? I mean, I think that just if you look in the last week, I mean, Alon going on, Rogan, you sitting down mm -hmm. here, again, without patting myself on the back for a moment, like I view that as like a landscape change of the way people uh, that are our influencers, our visionaries, are reacting well, to I think, media. I think, uh, yeah, I, look, I think, look, I think the boxes are too narrow. You know, it's uh, like one, one, it's like, we, you know, it's like the baby boomer since 1968. They've been relitigating 1968 for 50 years. And we've had like, it's the same fights, they're getting kind of old, but it's been, been Groundhog Day for 50 years. And, um, and, uh, and, and maybe there's something past Groundhog Day. And that's, that's the bias you have, that's the bias I have. <laughs> right. And, uh, and I think part of it is, um, it's, it's not just talking about talking about ideas, it's, it's, you know, it's bringing forth some specific ideas. These are things that are different, that are changing, that are, you know, that where the world may look very different in the future from where it looks in the present. But I, I think we're not at the end of history. We're not at a time where ideas don't matter or where people can't do things. I think the future will be very different from the present. Maybe it's gonna be better, maybe it's gonna be worse. It's up to us. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm super long uh, having a, a very broad conversation about things. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought up the baby boomers for a moment, because it does seem like that partly what's happening here is that they're at their last grasps of controlling mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And in an odd way, Gen X, my generation, got, which I think you're, you're probably mm -hmm. at the right around the, a little bit ahead of me on Gen X, that we sort of got lost, and yes. then we—it's like almost like we handed everything off to the millennials, but we didn't give them any of the tools to be able. They were too young and didn't have yes. the tools or the or the financial instruments to be able to yes. make any change. Does that does that make well, sense? Well, there are there are a lot of strange generational dynamics one could uh, one could talk about. I've I've been very struck um, in recent months in thinking about this how there is something very odd in terms of what happened to Gen X, um, which is people born say 1965 to 1980, mm -hmm. as the birth years, uh, boomers were sort of 46 to, to 64. Yeah. And, uh, and somehow, you know, the boomers dominated things like crazy. And, uh, and there was, uh, it, we were sort of like in the shadow of these people um, in, the, in, the, in all sorts of different, uh, in all sorts of different contexts. And uh, you know, it, was, it was, Gen X was probably the first time that you had a generation that was smaller in numbers than the one that came before us, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the, the, it, it sort of coincided with an era of you know, slower growth, slower progress. So there were sort of fewer opportunities to rise. Uh, you know, baby boomers held on to their positions, and it, in some ways, you know, it was like when I when I started working at a law firm in Manhattan in the early '90s. I mean, I, was, I wasn't thinking of it consciously this way, but it was the baby boomer partners. They just become partner, and they were sort of pulling the ladder up behind them, mm -hmm. and it was going to be much harder for people my generation, our generation. To, to do the same things, to go down the track in the same in the same way, and so there is something you know there is something very weird about how um, how Gen X has gotten um, you know ha has been sort of sidelined by the boomers for so long. Yeah, and then the you know the rap on us um, is always that we're you know we're too uh, too young or too old, <laughs> right. right? And so we were you know in the '90s when Gen X was starting the tech companies. Uh, we were seen as too young. Mm -hmm. We needed adult supervision. We needed the baby boomers to, to run the companies, and that's and almost every Gen X uh, founder, and some exceptions, but um, overwhelmingly the boomers took over the companies. Hmm. There was a version of this with Yahoo and eBay, uh, Netscape, um, even Google, which was the biggest of the Gen X companies. Um, uh, you know, you had a 10-year period where Eric Schmidt, the baby boomer, took over uh, took over Google, whereas you know the boomer companies, Apple. Microsoft, um, uh, Amazon, um, Microsoft and Amazon were just the same people got to run them the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Apple's a little bit more chaotic. Facebook, millennial company, they got to run it. Gen X, uh, not so much. Do you think that's... I, I, think, I think one could... And, and, and tech is like meritocratic. It's not supposed to be about right. culture and voting and stuff like this. Um, and then I, th I think, um, I think on, a po on a political level, it's striking how underrepresented we are. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, 2020 should be, should be a prime year for a Gen X mm -hmm. presidential candidate on the Democratic side, someone mm -hmm. born between 1965 and 1980. And I challenge you to name me a, a single plausible Gen X uh, Democrat. 
Like, don't pick a loser like Cory Booker. <laughs> Right. I mean, that's the thing. Well, I think there's several reasons for that on the Democratic side. But They've gone they, off they, so they, deep they, end on it's, the... it's somehow the boomers, they're, they're more of them. And so they, they, they look like it's, it's truth in numbers. And it's the, the baby boomer bubble, in a way, has always been that the numbers make it right. That if yeah. you have a lot of people, it's true. And that's kind of what worked. And so, you know, it, it, you know, the boomers were this unusually big generation. And it was just about them. It's just about getting consensus. And then you could overwhelm things. And that's... That's what you had to do. Hmm. And I think that's, that's sort of coming to an end slowly. I wonder, do you think there's also just a flat out technological component to this? That we in Gen X, we're the last generation that grew up without all of this mm -hmm. tech. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the exact connection is, but I remember mm -hmm. being in college, I think my freshman year, I remember some kid down the hallway screaming, I'm, I'm on the internet. Mm -hmm. And I went into his room, I've told the story a couple of times, I went into his room and it said, Yankees three, Royals one, and it had two pictures of the logos. And I swear on my life, I remember thinking, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Like we did not grow up with the mm -hmm. phones in our pockets. We didn't grow up connected, all of those things. So it almost seems to me there's some connection to that where then the millennials came in, they were mm -hmm. so connected to all of this. Then the media, because the media mm -hmm. wants clicks and everything, paid so much attention to them that that maybe pushed out Gen X a little bit more. Do you, you think there's? I'm just I'm just doing this. You know, sort of like this of sort of head. cultural history, it's always many variables, yeah. and super overdetermined. I I do think there's there's um, there's something about the millennial vibe that feels more conformist. Yeah, and Gen X feels less conformist, and and so uh, and so one of the you know, good and bad things about being overly connected, overly technologically connected is, you know, you get to you get to know the score right away, you get the answer right away, you know you're supposed to um, be scared of climate change right <laughs> away, um, and that's good if it's true, ah. and it's bad if it's a shortcut. And so our generation, you could say, was the last one where, that didn't take shortcuts. And most of the time, you're, the boomers learned to take shortcuts. We you know, we didn't take as many shortcuts. Ah, I like that. Millennials know to take all the shortcuts. And um, it's a good idea to take shortcuts in a world where nobody takes shortcuts. Um, in a world where everybody takes shortcuts, um, you know, you have to actually figure out, maybe the shortcut isn't gonna work and, and you're actually better off figuring out the other thing. Yeah, so I think, oh, I love that. So, so one way to frame this would be in the, in the boomer era, um, the boomers who figured out how to take shortcuts. So the shortcut in politics is, I'm not gonna figure out what I think about the issues, I'm just gonna look at the polls. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the pollster is the one who's really running for president, and we're just listening to the pollster. And that was, that was an effective boomer technique for many years, that you just look at, at the polls. And if you, were, if you had a better pollster, you could more quickly get to where the puck was going, where the crowd was going, and you didn't need to think. You didn't need to waste time thinking about stuff. And so in a world where very few people were doing it, that could be a very good strategy. By the time you get to the, something like the millennials where everyone's been trained to do shortcuts, that it somehow doesn't quite work. It, it vaguely maps onto the tracking because you can think of tracking in school, tracking professionally mm -hmm. is a way to, it's like a shortcut to a successful career. And so the b baby boomers who stayed on track did quite well. So if you didn't you know, tune in and drop out and the late 60s and just went to law school and you became a partner in a law firm, that it kind of, the tracks worked. Mm -hmm. By the time we get to the millennials, they know all the tracks you're supposed to do. Tracks work less well when everyone knows them, Every, everyone's doing the same thing. So it has, there, there's sort of, there are these similarities between the millennials and the boomers, but the lesson, the, they're, 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 um, they're really different in practice and it's working really differently. So the, the things that would have worked perfectly for you as a boomer are, are deadly if you're a millennial. Yeah, so okay, so hearing that and knowing that our sense making is breaking down and our mm -hmm. ability, even our ability to just get away from all of this, mm -hmm. what you said before about you know paying that much mm -hmm. attention to politics and all that, everyone asks the whole IDW crew constantly, well, what are you guys gonna do? And you just said something about, you know, we shouldn't just talk about these things, we gotta mm -hmm. do things. Do you see either a technological answer here or a business answer here or Something, and I, we've talked about this a little bit privately before, and it's, we've kind of bounced it around, but like, 
everyone wants some answers to, to what's going on here with the media and, and everything else and, and, and the pipes, you know, that Google owns all the pipes and yes. all of that stuff. Yes. And I think a lot of people, yes. the default position yes. is, well, Teal will fix it because well, it's like there's only a couple people that actually could. Well, it's, it's um, I, don't, I don't actually quite know what one does to, to fix the, the media <laughs> industry. Um, I, I would say the, um, the thing that I'm always super fixated on is the business model question. So you know, my, yeah. my zero to one uh, book, uh, the, you know, so the main motif is always um, that you shouldn't compete, you should try to have a monopoly, you should try to do something that you do so well that you have no competition. Mm -hmm. And you know, there, there are good and bad things about monopoly, but from the inside, you generally want to have a monopoly. It gets a little bit bad if you become too fat and, and lazy and um, and uh, if you then ever have competition, you're really in trouble. And um, you know, in a way, the the business history I would tell of the um, the mainstream media is that they used to have great monopolies. Um, the newspapers had local content monopolies, and they got local monopolies on advertisers because the only way you could advertise was through you know the classified section of newspaper or news magazines or you know there are all these sort of um, all these sort of media monopolies. And um, what technology, what the internet has done, is it's, it's, it's opened things up in ways that are good for information, for, for learning things, but it's, it's very bad for their business models. And, uh, and I think this is something they, they never really understood. Mm -hmm. And so if you, were, you know, if you were at the Washington Post in the 1990s, you know, if you sort of imagine what the holiday party would have been like, um, you know, the, the owner of the Post would have said something like, you know, um, you know we're, all, we're all getting paid, you know, we're doing great, business is doing great, we have all these talented people that are writing great stories. And so the narrative would be that it was a great business because of um, the great work the people there were doing. And the true story was something like, uh, no, you're working for a utility company, <laughs> and it doesn't matter what you do because we'll, we're going to make these monopoly profits uh -huh. year after year after year. And then when the monopoly story started to break, um, the story was not, the monopoly's going away because they can't talk about that. Right, right. But the story was rather, um, we, don't, uh, we don't know anything about the internet or something like that. Right. And so I think, I think the, the challenge that uh, a lot of the media, old media businesses have, haven't even been described correctly. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then it, it's, but then it is, you know, it, it's sort of, it sort of plays out in you know, um, in you know, in, uh, and and you have to figure out some new ways to get distribution channels, some new ways to monetize, mm -hmm. and you know there are there. I, I think there will be models for doing that, but that's the that's the question: how to do it? How do you, you know, the, you can't go back to the old monopolies, though. Yeah, we we.